everybody, welcome to Chapter 3, Communities, Biomes, and Ecosystems. Doing another video lesson here in my backyard, coming to you live from New Jersey, or actually video recorded from New Jersey. Uh, I'd like you to have out your notebook, one so that we can look at our old vocab terms from the other day. These vocab terms are really coming almost entirely just from Section 3.1. Might be a good idea to have out your biozone books too. Also with your notebooks, I'm going to expect you to take a few notes. There'll be a few times when you're asked to stop the video and complete an activity or stop the video and look at another online video from YouTube. Let's begin. The big idea for Chapter 3 is seen at the bottom here. It says limiting factors and ranges of tolerance are factors that determine where terrestrial biomes and aquatic biomes exist. So the end of today is going to have you making a mini poster that you're going to split in half, so eight and a half by eleven, fold it in half. On one side you're going to get assigned an aquatic biome, and on the other you'll be assigned a terrestrial biome. You're going to include a few different aspects about the description of that biome. We'll collect them next week and we'll put them all together so we can learn a lot of neato facts all about biomes. Here's the first page. It looks at some of the things we're covering. The key terms for this section are just from 3.1, community, limiting factor, tolerance, secession that is both primary and secondary, and climax community. This first launch lab asks us, where is my biological address? Let's go ahead and stop and complete this activity either from this video or out of your textbook online on the iPad. For community ecology, our vocab terms that we just mentioned are seen over here on the right. Obviously our review pieces from last, um, last video in Chapter 2 are seen on the bottom. We'll begin by looking at levels of biological organization. We are happening right in here. Communities where they're looking at these bears climbing up in a tree. This is falling in between ecosystems and populations. So what is a community? We can have our normal definition out of the book which says a biological community is a group of interacting populations that occupy the same area at the same time. Go ahead and make sure you've got that definition down quite well. We'll remember that it's the abiotic and the biotic factors that are influencing our community. Here's a list that shows a pretty good sampling of what we'd see for the non-living influences and the living influences on our ecosystems. Not to mention what we're looking at within our Green Lake community and even on the microscope with our Green Lake micro communities. You saw it last time with this really exciting and energetic community in Southern Africa in Kruger National Park. You see it with the different interactions shown here, interspecific, interspecific so between species interactions and the way in which they influence a community. All right, let's take a look up top here. Our first major vocab term, new one at least, will be limiting factors. So any abiotic or biotic factor that restricts the numbers, reproduction, or distribution of an organism. That's our limiting factor. You'll study this next year in chemistry with a limiting reagent. A good way to look at it might be to see it as, what is that weakest link within the community? You can see it here with some barrels that show on the front a number of abiotic um, factors, in this case mineral contents, and in the back climate yield control, uh, soil pH, insect uh, and disease control, shown over here water input. And if you fill that barrel with the water, the point or the slat that is lowest will be where the water leaks out. Right? That would be considered in this diagram the limiting factor. How about when you go into the grocery store? If you're going to buy hot dogs and hot dog buns, you see that up here you got eight hot dog buns, down here ten hot dogs. So really you could only make eight hot dog and hot dog bun combinations. The limiting factor would be the hot dog buns. If you're looking for a funny commentary on this, uh, you could click on this link and see Steve Martin go crazy all about hot dog buns in the movie Father of the Bride. In this example with 
brownie mix and eggs. You got two boxes. Each box requires two eggs in order to make the brownies. You can see that you've got excess of eggs because in the end you've only used four total and that means the boxes are a limiting range. What you could do with this since they require two each is you could have made six total sets of brownies or even more. Another way to look at it is with hamburgers. Mm. So you got hot dog buns, the cheese, the lettuce, and the actual burgers. The one that's present in the smallest amount is our limiting reagent or limiting factor. In this case that would be the lettuce. Meaning you could only make a total of three complete hamburgers given this set of ingredients. Next vocab term is range of tolerance. So for any environmental factor there's an upper and lower limit that define the conditions in which that organism can survive. You'll notice that on the bottom we've got these for fishies. In this case the gradient is for temperature change. This gives us a generalized image of this. Other examples of gradients besides temperature could be salinity, it could be time of day, it could be uh, nutrient concentration, it could be predation, it could be altitude, it could be depth. Again in this case with the fish it's looking at optimum range for temperature and you see that it's clustered in the middle you can get further out in the stress region and then even farther out beyond that where the organism is intolerant to those conditions. This is a old diagram that's showing plant growth and you notice on the bottom we've got optimal range, the limits of its tolerance and where it can grow and then death occurring outside of those ranges. So this range of tolerance is looking at on the y-axis range of growth and the x-axis gradient in this case is the temperature. Next section or next piece is on ecological succession. Make sure that we're clear on the differences between limiting factors and range of tolerance. For succession we've got a sequence of community and ecosystem changes after a disturbance, which gets us thinking what do we mean by disturbance? So it can be an event that changes a community, removes organisms from a community, alters resource availability. Common examples of a disturbance that are natural might be a fire, a flood, a windstorm, earthquake. We'll also spend a little bit of time on the all too common causes of human made disturbances. Climate change would be a big and ongoing example of that. Go ahead and stop the video right now. Uh, check out this link from our friends over at Crash Course on Ecological Succession. Welcome back. Uh, next, after that video, take a quick look. This is a detailed list on ecological succession modeling. So you've got a set of 24 indicators or ecosystem attributes and then the presence of those attributes in a developing stage ecosystem or a mature stage. So just take a look. No need to write down notes. It just might be interesting. This could also be um, analogized and placed in a uh, mechanical or business type model. And you see where models for ecology and biology can overlap with human models. One of our more common examples of a disturbance would be a fire. Keep in mind that many disturbances are built into the evolution of species and so that fire in some ecosystems is a necessity. One example of that would be in the Yellowstone Fire of 1988. I remember when I was your age doing a project on this, so it was a few years after that. But you can see soon after the fire, landscape charred. In pretty short time, just a year later, the ecosystem was rebounding quite a bit. In this article they talk about it being a blessing in disguise. With human disturbances, there's almost always a decrease in species diversity. Five examples of human disturbances can be summarized with the acronym HIPPO. Habitat destruction, invasive species, pollution, population, and over-harvesting. Let's stop right now. 
pick one of those and spend about five minutes on the internet doing some research, throw some info and drawings about your human disturbance into your notebook. Uh -huh. All right, next section, we're looking at community one, or one community influencing another. We saw this last week in the TED Talk on rewilding, the way in which wolves change the physical geography and whales change the atmosphere through a number and a series of events. Let's make sure that those are clear and detailed, kind of flow chart or step-by-step -step in your notebook. This is a summary video in case you're uh, forgetting a little bit of that last one. So go ahead and stop the video real quick and look at how wolves can change rivers. Here's another one talking about big carnivores go down, even the vegetarians take a hit. We'll also stop the video one more time and look at this link from the BBC on jumbo gardeners and how elephants affect our weather. We can take a look at primary secession. So the difference between primary and secondary secession is whether or not soil is present. In the case of primary secession, there is no soil left. And so pioneer species that come in after the disturbance will be charged with creating new soil. We can go ahead and look at figure three up here from your book and draw that in our notebooks. This section here highlights it. It says a mature community can eventually develop from bare rock, so loss of soil, uh, bacteria, fungi, protists, mutualistic symbiotic relationships such as lichen can come in and actually build and create soil. A stable mature community that results when there's little change in that composition of species, that's what's termed a climax community with climax species involved. On page 118 in our book, we've got our data analysis lab. Let's interpret this data. So go ahead and stop the video, take a read through this, and answer these questions with your group in your notebook. There's a nice figure that's showing secession's endpoint, so from very beginning. And on the x-axis, we've got a series of dates, in this case from zero up past 75 years of a mature ecosystem. Let's take a look in our book and online. Jot down as many pioneer species as you can. We're reminded of our model for ecological secession and the traits that are present, as you see, and go from early stages of secession to late stages or developing to mature ecosystem. Here's a pretty picture. It shows all the way to the side this climax community. Again, reminding you the difference between primary and secondary is whether or not soil remains after the disturbance. In the case of retreating glaciers here with the McBride Glacier, that ice is going to be, ice and rock is going to pull off all soil. So this would be an example of primary secession. We can check at this looking closely to interpret type of secession in the case of the Yellowstone fires would be secondary because the soil did remain after the fire. Ah, not too far from here, or from Seattle rather, will be Mount St. Helens and what happened after the eruption there. All right, section 3.2 on biome. So really section 3.2 on terrestrial and 3.3 on aquatic. Let's take five minutes to skim through this on your book. It starts on page 121. Then you're going to get assigned one biome from terrestrial land and one biome from aquatic. What you're going to want to put on your two halves of your eight and a half by 11 sheet will be things like the distribution, how much precipitation, the temperature ranges, plant and animal life, and then current human impact. So maybe type in your biome and see if there's a news section within Google. We also want to make sure we include neato facts. Okay, don't spend forever, but this should take you to the end of the period. If you have any questions, check with your teammates, shoot me an email. Uh, enjoy. I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with for your mini posters. All right, take care.